Today, we're going to start a four-week four series, a four-word series, I don't know what that would be, but a four-week series on the Psalms. We are going to try to understand what the Psalms are to be used for. We're going to try to understand how the Psalms can be applied to our own lives. We're going to try to understand that there are four different genres of Psalms. They are known as Wisdom Psalms. They are known as Psalms of Lament. They are known as Praise Psalms. And today we start with the Royal Psalms. The Royal Psalms um, were about an opportunity to remind God and the king and the people of the relationship and the covenant that existed between them all. You see that God called the king into special relationship. A little background. Way back in Samuel, in 1 Samuel, they didn't have a king. God was enough. It was a theocracy. God said, do this. The prophets told the people. The priests told the people. And the people did what God said. And as long as they stayed in good relationship with each other, all was wonderful. You didn't need a king. But the people rose up and they said, we want to be like everybody else. They're just like children. And we've all been children. I want those jeans because everybody else has those jeans. I want that t-shirt. I have to shop at that store. We want a king. <laughs> and Samuel says, you don't need a king. You've got God. You don't need a king. And the people continue to whine and bellyache and moan. And finally, God says, well, let them have a king. If they want a king, let them have a king. And so eventually Saul is called. And in his very first act as king, you know what? He makes God angry. And God says, Saul can't be a king anymore. We need to find a new king, Samuel. And Samuel's like, you're putting me in a bad spot. You're putting me in a bad spot, but I'll do what you tell me to do because you are God. So he goes during a festival time when he should be with the king and should be with the people in a very prominent position. And he goes to a little town and he meets with a man named Jesse who has several sons. And Jesse brings his oldest and strongest son and says, this is the son you're looking for? This is the son that's going to be the new king? Nope, nope, nope. It's all the way down to the freckly-faced youngest son who's been out in the farm with the sheep, taking care of them. And it's David, and David is called. And David becomes the great king, the great king. And the warrior king comes and conquers all the territories, puts Israel in a special place. And it is through David that God makes a covenant. A special one. As long as there is a king in Israel, you and your family, your sons, will be the royals. You will be the kings. It is from you from this point on. This is the reason that Jesus has to be related to David, by the way. Do you understand that? That without this special relationship, if the Messiah is to come, if a new king is to come after all this time that the Israelites have been without a king, it's got to be someone who's related to David because God and David made a covenant. And so the royal psalm reminds the sitting king and God of their relationship to each other. The royal psalm will remind the king about his relationship to the people. And that is what we come to listen to as we hear Psalm 72. It's printed, um, the first seven verses are printed in your bulletin if you'd like to read along. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and at the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the bone grass like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. May God have blessing and understanding for the hearing of these words this day. 
The Psalms are nothing more than a hymn book, a prayer book. They are to lead the people in worship. And so this psalm would have been spoken in worship, again, reminding everyone of the special relationship. Help me to know if you've ever heard these words. In this grave hour, perhaps the most faithful in our history, I send to every household of my peoples, both at home and overseas, this message, spoken with the same depth of feeling for each one of you, as if I were able to cross your threshold and speak to you myself. The speaker of these words continues to go on. The peoples of the world would be kept in bondage of fear and all hopes of settled peace and of the security of justice and liberty among nations would be ended. This is the ultimate issue which confronts us. For the sake of all that we ourselves hold dear and of the world's order and peace, it is unthinkable that we should refuse to meet the challenge. It is to this high purpose that I now call my people at home and my peoples across the sea who will make our cause their own. If one and all we keep resolutely faithful to this cause, ready for whatever service or sacrifice it may demand, then with God's help we shall prevail. May God bless and keep us all. It's a radio address from a king. And if you've seen the movie The King's Speech, then you've heard this speech. It was given in 1939 by King George VI. You may remember that he became king when he wasn't supposed to be king. His father was King George V, and he was fine being a prince. He once gave a speech, it was so bad, everybody cringed, including himself. If you've seen the movie, you remember it. He's kind of at, um, I think, like a racetrack for horses, and he's trying to deliver his speech, and he can't make it through because he stutters so badly. It gets to be so difficult for him that he and his wife, they find a speech therapist. They find someone to help him out. The man is known as Lionel Logue. They become great friends. This is all through his princeship, not his kingship. The movie takes a few liberties. Birdie, as he's known before, he's known as King George VI, is trying to overcome. He's given these unorthodox ways. Do you remember when um, Lionel says, what's your favorite cuss word? And he says, use that because it breaks your chain of thought and gets you to where you need to be. He uses very different techniques. It gets to a point where he is finally the king, and he has to deliver a speech. And I think this speech is shown in the movie, and this is the one speech that's probably more important because it's the first speech. It's given um, well before the 1939 speech. But the one in the movie is 1939, where he stands in front of his people and he says, we have a madman acting in the world we have to come, and we have to unite, and we have to defeat Hitler. He calls the people of England, maybe even the people of the world, to action. And he gets through it. That first speech, and that 1939 speech, without one hesitation. Mike and I may need to take lessons. <laughs> we might need our own Lionel Lowe. Kings are always called to very important actions, aren't they? They're always called to big things. They're always called to special relationships. It's no different with the Hebrew kings, no different with the kings of Israel. The sons of David, David, and even Saul. Saul had a special relationship with God too, but it didn't last long. David and his descendants were to have this relationship. And as we read the psalm, we hear what the king is supposed to be about. Who was the king supposed to stand up for? The poor. First and foremost, this is what the king is supposed to do. The king is to stand up and take care of the poor. 
Now the king had a thousand different jobs. But according to the psalm, this is the most important one. This is the job. And so, as an act of worship, as they're reading the psalms, as they're reading and singing their hymns, they say, oh God, let our king take care of the poor. First and foremost. And then, there's more. As we keep going down the list, we understand that through the king, righteousness, God's righteousness should come into the world. That through the king, peace should abound. And how do righteousness and peace come? It comes, these good gifts of God come when the king takes care of the poor, the downtrodden, the needy. When the king does these things, God is expressed into the world in wonderful ways. The covenant, then, with God and the king, and God and the people people will continue to serve their king because the king is an expression of God in the world. They will continue to serve God because they have a covenant that says I will be your God and you will be my people and here's the one who's going to help us understand what that means. The psalm continues on. The psalm continues on. We hear how the people hope that the king will defeat all of his enemies. Which is a pretty selfish thing, because the defeating of the king's enemies is the defeating of their own enemies, right? So they want the king to be able to put down all those who might rise up against him. They want the king to have plenty of gold and to be honored and to be blessed. But most of all, as the psalm comes to the end, you see, as the psalm comes to the end, the relationship that is most important is the one that is honored most. Whose name is to be revered most? most, whose name is to be held on high most, who is to be blessed most, the God of Israel. So the royal psalm is that opportunity for the people to say in worship, we love you, God, the most. We love our king, and we want our king to bring your peace and your righteousness. We want our king to act in certain ways in this world so that we will know you. As we come to midterm elections, good values to think about. <coughs> As I was reading two scholars, they both admit that this psalm was for a sitting king. The original intent of this psalm was for a sitting king, for a king who would have been up on the throne and people would have reminded themselves in worship of what they wanted from their king and reminded the king what was expected of him. And so this, was this, 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 this psalm was to be used in an actual and real way. So that all of this could resonate with the people. And so, they try to date this psalm. They try to figure out, these scholars, they try to figure out when the psalm might have been written. That's one of the things that people like to do who are smarter than I. They like to try to figure out when things were written and how they were done. And so they, they, they do their best, but this psalm has no date. But they think it might have been during the time of Solomon. Have you heard of King Solomon? The third king of Israel, there was Saul, there was David, and then there was Solomon. Solomon is the first to receive that special covenant from God to David. He's the first son of David to sit the throne. He's known as the wise king. Do you remember that? Those of you who might remember Solomon, you know that he is the wise king because of two things. Right before he was about to become king, he was asleep and he had a vision. And in that vision, God comes to him and says, you, Solomon, are about to become king. I have a special relationship with you because you are son of David. You're sitting on the throne. I will give you anything that you want. Ask and you shall receive. If given that opportunity, what would you ask for? He could have asked for wealth and riches. He could have asked for women. He could have asked for 
um, the opportunity to be a conquering military man. He could have asked for a, a hundred different things, and he asked for one simple thing. So God, give me wisdom to rule your people. Give me wisdom to rule your people. And God was so pleased with that answer that Solomon got all those other things as well. As king, he is sitting as a judge. That's part of the job of a king sometimes is to rule over the matters. And two women, um, two prostitutes, the Bible says, they come to him. They've been living in the same place. They had children born to them at about the same time. During the middle of the night, one of the women rolls over and smothers her child. And she's so distraught. She's so distraught. She doesn't know what to do. She switches her child, who is now lifeless, with the other woman's child. They are obviously battling and fighting, and they've gone to court to try to get it settled. And it comes before Solomon, and Solomon listens to everything that they have to say. And the one is like, this is my child that she's stolen from me somehow in the middle of the night. And no, this is my child. This has always been my child. And Solomon says, that's all right. I got it. Bring me a sword, and we'll cut the child in half. And we'll give each of you half of the child. And the one woman says, oh, my king, no. And he immediately says, this is the mother. Give her the child. He was wise. He was blessed by God with wisdom. He was blessed also to be the sitting king during the most peaceful time in Israel's history. In their most prosperous time, he was able to serve. And so he sits there and he has this wisdom and these blessings and they think that Psalm 72 might have been written during the time that Solomon was king. There was a, uh, a kind of a new song that was pretty popular. This is for you, Bob Sherwood, during the World Series. It's called Royals, and all the young people in the room go, I know that song. And it's um, performed by a young woman named Lord. She's like 19, an interesting name for a music artist. She watched something about the Kansas City Royals in 1985, and she saw George Brett, and this song came to her, and it's called Royals. She starts the song off by talking about where she lives isn't any place to be proud of and that she lives in some kind of torn up town and that her, her um, postal code is nothing to be worried about. No one cares about where she's come from. But the chorus of the song says this. And I could sing it, but that would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> you, young people, you feel free if you want. Uh, and we'll never be royals, royals. It don't run in our blood. That kind of lux. That's hip for luxury day, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> that kind of lux just ain't for us. We crave a different kind of bus. Let me be your ruler, she says. You can call me Queen Bee, and baby, I'll rule, I'll rule, I'll rule. Let me live that fantasy. Have you ever thought that you could be a ruler? Serving your town, your state, your country? as a leader. Or do we sometimes think, that's not me. I don't have anything to rule over in my life. There's no place where I have any sphere of influence. I am so little. I used to have friends who would joke and say something like, my kingdom for a if they were thirsty, a Gatorade. <laughs> In seminary, we played a lot of ping pong. My kingdom for a paddle. My kingdom for anything you desire in the moment. My kingdom for a cookie. We're not kings. But we have a sphere of influence. We have a bit of the world that we have an opportunity to impact. It may be no bigger than your bedroom. Maybe no bigger than your house. Or your 
your church. That you have an opportunity to listen to the relationship that you have with God. To live faithfully in ways that bring peace and righteousness into the world. This Psalm 72, the second scholar that I read, the first scholar is fine to let, let it just be for a sitting king, but the second commentator <coughs> says that by the time the Psalter, the hymn book, was actually put all together in one place, like we have put together a book like this to use in worship, by the time it was put all together, Israel no longer had kings. They'd been conquered too many times and spread throughout the world, dispersed the diaspora. They were pushed to the ends of the world. Their leaders had been taken away from them. There were no kings. There was no longer any Israel. And so when they sang this song in worship after that time, they were looking to a future king. They were looking to the Messiah. They were looking for the one who would bring peace and prosperity and the nation back. They were looking for the one who would fulfill the righteousness of God. They were looking for the one who would bring peace to them again. Friends, we call ourselves disciples of Christ. Christian, we believe that the Messiah has come. This psalm, if it was messianic in nature, was looking towards the Messiah. This psalm is about the one who is the center of our faith. And as the people who follow the one who is to bring God's righteousness and peace. As disciples of Christ. job. We have a faith to live. We have a covenant to uphold. The psalm is beautiful, and it was written for a long time ago. But as believers, let's not let the words be empty. <coughs> the faithful people of God. Let it be about God's reign, or God's kingdom, or God's realm. And let there be righteousness. And let there be peace. Let us truly be the faithful people God has called us to be. In the name of the Messiah. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.